Um, Monday. So we look at what happened over the weekend, what we're thinking, looking at what we need to be aware of for the week coming up. And so we'll start off first with Dr. Yaffe. We'll go over there are data points and issues of what went on and where we're at today. So over to you, Dr. Yaffe. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Since our last update on Thursday, Ontario is reporting an additional 5,854 cases of COVID-19. That's 1,371 on Friday, 1,468 on Saturday, 1,747 on Sunday, and 1,268 cases today. Yesterday's elevated case count is in part due to a data catch-up process following issues with our case and contact management system. Our seven-day average for daily cases is currently 1,350, which is up from last week when the average was 1,155, and two weeks ago when it was 1,099 cases. We're also reporting an additional 53 deaths since our last update on Thursday, which includes nine deaths today. Today, there are 699 people with COVID-19 in hospital, up from 626 last week. The number of people in, in ICU today is 298, which is an increase from last Monday when it was 282. With respect to testing, today we're reporting almost 34,000 tests completed with a percent positivity of 3.8%. This is the highest percent positivity since February 23rd. The average percent positivity over the last seven days is 3%, which is up from 2.6% for the same time period last week. Today, we're reporting a total of 1,184 confirmed variants of concern in Ontario. Of these, the majority, 1,106, are of the B117 or UK variant. 44 are of the B1351 or South African variant. And 34 are of the P1 or Brazilian variant. There are an additional 8,630 samples that have screened positive for a mutation where no lineage has been determined. And the weekly percent positivity for cases tested for mutations or variants of concern for the period March 3rd to the 9th is 36.1%. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Williams for further comments. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, much to think about with the numbers and data. Uh, first of all, today is Monday. That meant, it means that a number of the health units have been uh, progressing into the framework and different levels uh, as of um, midnight or 12.01 uh, this morning. And uh, so have, some have shifted up, only one or two went down. Uh, the main one we want to note that Lambton Public Health Unit moved into the gray zone or lockdown zone. So that means we have five at the moment, Lambton, Thunder Bay, uh, Sudbury or District Health uh, Sudbury, and Toronto and Peel still. So we have those five at that level. Others had uh, moved up somewhat in progression to different levels in there. <clears throat> and this was concerning to us as we have seen um, the percent, the number of positives, the positivity per 100,000 going up over the last week or so. And so this was this uh, time of watching carefully to see what's occurring. As Dr. Yaffe alluded to, with our test coming in, the high positivity rate combined with um, a higher percentage of the variants of concern showing up on our data is what we had been warned about by Dr. Brown in the scientific table, and we are watching that very carefully. Some of our data numbers over the weekend were high. There was some data delay and entry things. They're all real cases, by the way. It was just a matter of the flow, but they still are up, and we are watching it and seeing if we can keep it under control, and that's why it's a very critical thing at this time 
to make sure that we continue on our personal behavior with uh, the distancing, the masking, staying within the households and being very cautious about contacts because of the variance of concern and their easily uh, transmittability, uh, the greater ease of transmittability is of concern. <clears throat> and we've seen that in various jurisdictions and when we've had outbreaks, it has been commented by local public health. It seemed to move very quickly and the incubation period was even shorter in some of their experiences. So. Uh, we have this task of keeping this under control to see if we can keep the rise in the variance of concern uh, level. Uh, I'd like to bring it down ideally and we'll have to see how the numbers deal with or carry on over this week ahead. Why? At the same time, of course, we announced the vaccine booking system today. And this has been a major undertaking uh, to put this all together. <clears throat> and the first group of booking is for uh, those 80 or over into the system. And um, so far, it's been working okay. There are some glitches, as always, we would expect some. Uh, the system had already put through 30,000 uh, individuals, so some are booking for two doses, of course, uh, up until the early this afternoon. So that's a significant input. I would say it's the one thing is that it's not important who's first to get booked, it's more important to get booked. And so whether you're the first one inside the vaccine clinic or the 10th or 20th, it uh, doesn't matter as much. Pick the time that works for you, especially if you're uh, over uh, the age of 80, when you can be uh, brought to the location, what, make, what makes the best sense for you, and you're getting your two appointments booked in that time. So again, it's not a race to get in there. It's more to get booked in the system because we want to do everyone over 80 that's our first priority at this stage, in that agent stage. We have other priority groups too, and they're still covering those ones off at this time. So uh, we know that vaccination is our best defense. We've seen great impact of that in our long-term care home residents and in retirement homes as we complete all those with their second dose because of their high, more, their more uh, elevated level of vulnerability in there. So we are continuing that process. But again, the booking system, uh, so far there have been some um, uh, error messages. We are looking assertively at that now to correct those issues. Uh, we are not surprised to find some. We want to know as soon as we can so we can quickly put our staff and our experts together to solve that problem and to make it as easy and as smooth for you as possible, whether it's through our electronic booking or through our call-in centers in there because we want you booked, we want you in the system, and we want to make sure we cover everyone we need to cover in the right time. So we're making progress with the uh, vaccination. Uh, our specialists say that so far we have good coverage uh, with, our va with our variants as well, especially with some of the ones we're doing with our elderly population in that. So if we keep at it, keep focused, especially keep our guards up around our personal protection because the vaccine is a protection, but you know what you do, you need now to protect yourself. You can do it and we know that you can do it. And it's the when people sort of lay those precautions aside and think it's just okay to do this or do that. There's fatigue in, I understand that. People are getting pent up like spring breaking. They want to get out and do that. And I understand that and I appreciate that. And um, <clears throat> if we have a few more weeks, we can keep getting caught up as we try to get more and more vaccine in and move on it more uh, assertively to get everybody done as soon as we can, looking as the general had uh, uh, communicated to get our first run through of everyone, even uh, by the first day of summer. And so that's, um, that's a daunting task for us to do. And uh, so we're up for the task and we want to make sure we can meet that. And that gives people lots of ideas and optimism about how the things might be in the summer or after the summer as compared to last summer. So stay positive, stay uh, focused, stay stringent on your adherence to the measures um, because we still have to beat these variants down and get them under control and not let it take over with that rapid rise that the um, modelers had predicted could happen, didn't say it would especially if we're careful with our public health measures. So let's be careful, let's be consistent, and let's be caring of each other during this time because the, uh, the end is in sight in this regard, but we're moving towards that. So with that, I'm gonna open up for questions from the media. We'll go to the phone yeah. lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. 
Your first question comes from Cynthia Mulligan from City News. Cynthia, please go ahead. Hello, doctors. The Ontario Hospital Association has declared that Ontario is in the third wave, and they're citing many of the numbers that you've cited, increasing hospitalizations, ICU beds, um, the RT value, um, the variants, they say that they're up to, they're quoting the Ontario Science Table saying that they're up to 49% of all cases now. Do you agree? Are we in a third wave? <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> the modelers are looking at to say that we could be going into a third wave. Whether we're in a true third wave is always... Um, as they always say, one of our people on our team says, you can always tell you're in it after it's over when it's up there. <clears throat> we have to see we're in this dip and coming up. Is it a slight undulation? Is it a large wave? Is it a moderate wave? To be determined. And I think we can deal with that and move on that one there. The positivity, um, when they hear the 49%, uh, that's uh, in that one day. And that can be a matter of what the samples were and how they received. Uh, we've had some down even lower. So we do the seven-day rolling average. But even that one is heading up into the upper 30% level, uh, heading towards 40. So while I would say we weren't 49 overall, that 49 with the other averages means the whole thing is continually moving up from the low 30s to the mid to the upper 30s. So at the moment, uh, I can... I would not be surprised if we moved over 40 percent because as the variants of concern are rising as a percentage of the tests being positive, the tests of the other ones are going down uh, in there, the uh, so-called um, other variants uh, or other uh, COVID strains, initial ones we had in there. So it becomes more and more of a higher percentage. So uh, we could be, I would say, <clears throat> we are into that base of a third wave. What does that mean? How big it is? That's to be determined, and we can collectively seek to put input on that if we are careful, if we maintain uh, public health measures, personal measures, and keep uh, that task in mind while we continue our vaccination of our most vulnerable populations first. Follow-up? Thank you. And now that the vast majority of long-term care residents have had not one but two vaccinations, what are your thoughts on relaxing the restrictions? I mean, for many, life has not changed very much or at all since they became vaccinated, and they're wondering why they can't start doing more and being closer to more people. Dr. Yaffe, answer that one. Uh, thank you. That, that is a question that's very much under discussion uh, currently, uh, both within the government of Ontario, but also across the country. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was on a call with our counterparts in the other provinces, territories, and uh, federal level, and um, looking at uh, what are the considerations that need to be uh, put into place to look at this issue, because absolutely, uh, we are really pleased with the high vaccination rate, particularly among residents in long-term care, and the rising vaccination rates in the uh, staff and the essential caregivers. And the data the science table has put forward has shown that the uh, deaths have gone down significantly, uh, hospitalizations have gone down. However, there have still been some outbreaks in uh, long-term care homes in uh, some uh, jurisdictions where there has been vaccination. So, um, of course, we want to uh, loosen uh, the restrictions as much as possible, but we also want to maintain uh, prevention and protection of the of these very vulnerable people. So um, we're working very closely on that right now in terms of measures both to um, prevent introduction of the virus into the facilities and to prevent transmission, uh, considering that we have um, probably on average over 90, 90, 95 percent of residents vaccinated, but something like 50 to 60 percent of caregivers or staff. So it's uh, very much on our on our radar currently to look at this um, and look at the evidence across across the world. Next question. Your next question comes from Jeff Gray from the Globe and Mail. Jeff, please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the uh this issue of the, of the third wave, and, and he, I think Dr. Williams, you said it's sort of a little too early to, to call it, uh, whether that's what we're seeing, but uh, the RT numbers do look worrying, don't they? Are we not watching these, the variants in particular, rising at a 
quite rapid rate, and is there anything you're prepared to recommend the government to do, I don't know, further tightening in the gray zones or something like that to try and uh, cut that off before it uh, hits us? Okay, well, thank you for that. And one of the things we've been asking the science table to look at the RT uh, <clears throat> of the uh, variants of concern versus that of the uh, uh, COVID-19 we had throughout the uh, spring and the fall and into the early part of winter. And it looks like at the moment, especially that that uh, number is uh, climbing. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so we are watching that and we're going to be asking um, to say in with recommendations and that's why I announced at the outset that as we use the framework and as we see it increasing, one of our um, components is to move them into gray or lockdown zone. So we did some more this past week and we will continue to do that on a case by case basis. Follow up. Uh, but no, no, that no changes once you're in the gray zone. That's that those restrictions that we've we've got now. Those are what you'll see for the foreseeable future. I mean, Italy uh, and other countries, I think, have had to go into more severe lockdowns uh, as they deal with these variants. Um, in order to do that, we'd have to go back into our. If you're asking about stay-at-home orders. Uh, that was through our Emergency Measures and Civil Protection Act, and we'd have to put it back into the, for, to empower the Cabinet to put that back in place again to do that. Nothing precludes that Medical Officer of Health in their respective gray zones can give other Section 22 orders uh, to um, limit even further uh, in there, as you may call like a, a gray plus, and there may be specific uh, jurisdictions and sectors <clears throat> that they would see are especially problematic in their jurisdiction and would want to take further limitations in there. But for broad province-wide limitations, uh, as in going beyond everybody in gray, to go back to a stay-at-home type order, we'd have to, um, Cabinet would have to consider uh, reenacting the uh, Emergency Measures Act, the MCPA, and then taking that order further again. So it would be a different process. Next question. Your next question comes from Randy Rath from CHCH TV. Randy, please go ahead. Hi, doctors. Uh, Dr. Yaffe, you mentioned that we you we had we've had two um, variants that are of unknown origin. Um, could they be an Ontario mutation? Could that mutation have happened here? Uh Thanks for the question. I'm not sure uh, that I said there were two. Basically, uh, I was talking about their additional, um, actually, 8,630 8, that have screened positive, where no lineage has been determined. So uh, what that means is they're not, they're not the characteristic uh, UK, South African, or Brazilian. Um, do we... Uh, you know, I, th I believe 10 per at least 10 percent of the variants right now uh, are tested right down to the whole genome sequence. And if there were a common one uh, being identified, we would be notified by the province, uh, by the provincial lab. Uh, so at this point, no. Uh, it's not to say it can't happen. I mean, I know New York has their own um, apparently type that's been identified, um, California and so on. So uh, we could, but we don't at this point to my knowledge. Follow-up? Hey, and I also have a, a question about the AstraZeneca vaccine. The European Union is, is going to make a decision as to whether it should um, stop using it tomorrow. Um, as far as I know, we have no further supply of the AstraZeneca coming into the country. What happens to the people that have been vaccinated with one dose of AstraZeneca um, if something happens to the supply chain of AstraZeneca? Can they be... Um, given their booster shot of a different vaccine, will that work? So uh, we have to be clear on when we're watching the investigation of the AstraZeneca vaccine <clears throat> situation in Europe. Uh, we've watched the initial um, <clears throat> rollout of that and the concerns they had, and they were dealt with a certain lot number that was produced in the European sector. And part of our aspect of monitoring adverse events and we do this very carefully in Canada, uh, looking to document those and understand 
because uh, in the past, when we have other vaccines come out, sometimes there can be some unusual things in a specific lot of production, and we keep an eye on that. <clears throat> and all events are taken seriously, and we like to investigate those completely to see if there is a, a, a causal relationship or an association between the events at this time. We know they're undertaking those investigations in Europe at this moment. Uh, none of our vaccines arrive from are from the European sector. Ours are from the uh, the uh, SII, that's the Serum Institute of India, and so they're not produced in the same um, uh, institutions at all. So we haven't received any from the European sector at this time. So we're watching to see what they find out, <clears throat> investigate. We have enough supply to make sure we can um, have our handling our individuals who get their first dose and either second dose. At the same time. There have been some asking some questions, and I know our, um, our advisory committee, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, has been asked questions about can you mix and match uh, between mRNA vaccines, like between the Pfizer and Moderna, uh, <clears throat> can you mix between the vector one, as in the AZT, AstraZeneca, sorry, and the mRNA vaccines, the answer is uh, they're, they're looking into that matter and see what they can do there. Thank you. And so um, I would say we have to watch, and as we are, uh, to stay tuned and see what they're going to find out in the European investigation. Uh, as always, if you have concerns, your first aspect is if you have a lot concern number, as we have always done here in past with other vaccines, not any with, so far with COVID, uh, we would say if there's a lot concern, we ask everybody who has that to stop using it until the investigation is completed. Most times we find that it was a um, not attributed to the lot, but it's still better to be safe and investigate completely because uh, as the company says, they've given over 7 million doses and they haven't seen significant instances of these cases here. Nevertheless, I think it behooves the countries that are using them to make sure they investigate them to the full extent they need to to satisfy themselves and their public that they're, the ongoing safety of that uh, product, including of those specific lot numbers if they're going to use them, is assured. So that's the, how the due process and we'll wait to see what they find out. As of yet, it doesn't impact us with our supplies uh, at this time. Last question. Your last question comes from Sean Jeffers from the Canadian Press. Sean, please go ahead. Good afternoon, doctors. I wanted to uh, ask you a question about uh, the, uh, the vaccine rollout and specifically about uh, whether there's been any consideration given to targeting the vaccine rollout to communities that are in lockdown. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, you, there's been any thought given to, you know, uh, forwarding or, or moving vaccines more quickly into these communities to try to help them get out of lockdown. Well, that's a good question. We have, um, <clears throat> working with a local medical officer of health, if they're in a lockdown situation, I mean, there's a difference between the ones that are still coming out of the stay-at-home order, uh, the lockdown that is a gray zone with Toronto and Peel because they have not come out of it for a while versus the ones that went in through the emergency break type concept or with a sudden upswing in cases in their respective jurisdictions. Uh, we asked the medical officer of health if there are specific sectors that are identified as high risk. It's always um, challenging if you're going to try and vaccinate in the middle of an outbreak uh, because sometimes you're vaccinating with people who are still incubating and this makes it complicated to understand if you have any side effects. Is it from that the fact is that the vaccine does take at least three weeks to take effect? You may be um, <clears throat> having more uh, problems with because they have COVID. And so you want to be careful how you handle that and undertake that. Nevertheless, you may say there's a sector in your area that you're especially concerned about as a medical officer of health, and you're asking, could we have extra vaccine to deal with this sector in particular? And <clears throat> we know that in uh, Thunder Bay, where they have their lockdown, they asked for extra vaccine with their correctional services and with some other people in the homeless shelter group because they felt they were more at risk and we provided that vaccine for them. So this is a process that's there to be used for targeted um, <clears throat> high risk sectors that the local medical officer of health and team have identified are, are especially at risk in the midst of their um, lockdown or gray zone issues. And that is targeted very strategically and, of course, in a timely fashion, uh, what, as I already said, not why they're still in the midst of an outbreak, but maybe on a proactive basis to keep them under control so it doesn't spread any further. Follow-up, and this is the last question. 
And, and on that note, Dr. Williams, um, if we are in a third wave, as the Ontario Hospital Association is saying today, what is that going to mean for our vaccine rollout? I mean, what could the implications be? Will it slow it down? Um, no, it won't slow it down. <clears throat> I, we always would like to speed it up. And um, we're trying every way we can to get more vaccine quicker and sooner. And we'd like to work through our vulnerable populations. The one uh, aspect we have already, we know that our mRNA vaccines are very effective against the uh, variants. Uh, we have completed, as Dr. Yaffe said, uh, well over 95% of our residents in the long-term care facilities. And uh, uh, nearly a whole same proportion in our retirement home residents. We still have staff to get completed uh, in that, <clears throat> but our deaths in those institutions have come down considerably as well as morbidity. So it shows us that we have to move on the vaccination as as um, prodigiously and as quickly as possible. And now we're doing the over 80s. We're looking at other high risk categories and groups there. And that's why we shifted um, in that group there to deal with the one dose and uh, having a longer distance for the second dose to try and get as many other people with the two dose, with the one dose as soon as possible so that they get the benefit, especially the mRNA vaccine, the other vaccine, to have some protection to keep the variant at, at, at bay, if you may, and concerns, because all of them have demonstrated effectiveness in decreasing severity and hospitalization, uh, dealing with the COVID as well as with um, <clears throat> the other strains of the, of the variants. So it's a time race. And we would like to move that as fast as we can. Um, I know the general, as well as myself, we'd like to be um, moving with maybe a million doses a week if we had them. And I think we have the machinery in place. We're getting the booking going. But uh, we do need more vaccines. And uh, the sooner we get them, the better. And we're looking all over and trying to get those so that the people of Ontario who have shown great anticipation and enthusiasm, and thank you for that, and waiting your turn, we hope we can expedite that and get your time in the queue moved up even faster in the future. So that's how we would handle those issues, the variants. And that's why we've said from the uh, scientific table, we're in a race against time and way. While that's rising up, we'd like to suppress it with ongoing public health measures and personal protection, but also with vaccination. Thanks, everyone.